Welcome to The Book of Life, a show about Jewish people and the books we read. I'm Heidi Estrin. The Book of Life is a podcast service of the Feldman Library at Congregation B'nai Israel in Boca Raton, Florida. Additional support comes from the Association of Jewish Libraries. In this September 2007 episode of our podcast, we welcome the high holidays by looking at the world through new eyes. We'll talk to award-winning author-illustrator Mordecai Gerstein about his biblical picture book, The White Ram, which retells the story of Abraham and Isaac by focusing on the sacrificial ram. Holy holidays, Batman! Rabbi Carrie Friedman will tell us how the comic book superhero can help us with our New Year's resolutions. Musician Yoshi Fruchter introduces his CD, Beyond the Book, which reveals the inner thoughts of Bible personalities. And author Bryn Olenberg Sugarman talks about her picture book, Rebecca's Journey Home, and how it parallels her own story of building a family through adoption. While you're enjoying the show, please take a moment to inscribe yourself in the Book of Life's Book of Life. We've set up a guest book at jewishbooks.blogspot.com. If you're too shy to include your photo, consider using a picture of a Jewish book or CD you think other listeners would enjoy, or a screenshot of your website. You can even link to a YouTube video. It's a really nice way to get to know other Jewish book lovers, and it makes me kvel. So come on, get inscribed. Mordecai Gerstein is best known as the winner of the Caldecott Medal for the man who walked between the towers. And in Jewish circles, we celebrate his Sidney Taylor Book Award for Shalom's Treasure, a picture book biography of Shalom Aleichem. His newest Jewish book is The White Ram, a story of Abraham and Isaac. Based on a midrash, this picture book tells the story of the Akedah by focusing on the sacrificial ram. The White Ram won the National Jewish Book Award as well as a Sidney Taylor Silver Medal. We spoke to Mordecai by phone at his home in western Massachusetts. Mordecai, can you give just a brief summary of the story of the white ram? It's the story of the ram that takes Isaac's place for the sacrifice. And this uh, ram in the Torah was uh, kind of coincidentally there with its horns stuck in the brambles. But in the legend, the Midrash, the ram was created in the twilight of the first Sabbath just for the purpose of taking Isaac's place, because all things are known by God. God knew what would happen. And so he was created at at that time and kept in the Garden of Eden until he was needed to come and take Isaac's place. On the way to the mountain to save Isaac, he's thwarted and tempted by the evil one in various disguises, and finally, it's the evil one who becomes the bramble bush that the ram that entangles his uh, horns. In. And the ram, of course, does get there and does take Isaac's place and goes back into the hands of the Lord. Do you think the story of Isaac's sacrifice is more scary for children or for parents? I, I remember the story as a child, and I didn't find it scary. It was like the way I didn't find um, Hansel and Gretel scary. They were fairy tales. They were stories. I think parents might find them more scary. The idea of having to give up one's child uh, is a horrific thought to a parent. I ask that question because there are so few picture books that deal with this particular Bible story, and I wonder if it's because people think that it's too scary and they shouldn't turn it into a story for young children. I think they do. In fact, uh, you know, the story was turned down by an editor who had that feeling. But it's gotten a very positive response, framing it through the eyes of the ram and through the story of the ram. People are are more comfortable with it because they're very moved by the story of the ram. Tell us about the way God is depicted or not depicted in the illustrations. You know, I, I have done Midrashim before, and some of the Jewish readers, are the more orthodox ones, are troubled by my depiction of God. It's a way that I had come upon in earlier books where God was a character in the book of depicting God by using the landscape to suggest face and hands of God and to avoid depicting him directly. And in some cases, of course, you have to really search for the image. Some people don't see it at all. Some do immediately. It was a way to try to depict God without actually depicting him. 
You dedicate the book to all our fellow animals. Tell us more about that. Well, we have a dominion over all the creatures of the earth. We're kind of the caretakers of creation, uh, you know, according to Genesis. And we think so little, I, I think, of uh, animals in our lives and how we use them. You know, we take their lives, we take their bodies, we take their skins, we use them for labor. Without, without really uh, 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 being grateful, you know, to these other creatures on earth. And I thought that's what this book was about, really focusing on the ram, that the ram not only gives his life for the child, but also his cape to Elijah, his bones to make the foundations of Jerusalem, his ashes, the altar of the temple, and his intestines for the strings of King David's harp, you know. You could say that's what the story was about, to make us aware of what we owe to our fellow creatures. Mordecai Gerstein, thanks so much for speaking with us, and Shana Toba. And thank you very much. It's a pleasure. Wisdom from the Bat Cave How to Live a Super Heroic Life is Rabbi Kerry Friedman's Guide to Everyday Heroism. By asking, What would Batman do? we find answers that can inspire us to improve ourselves. Rabbi Friedman's unusual approach also inspired a book called Spiritual Survival for Law Enforcement and got him a gig with the FBI. We spoke to him by phone at his summer home in Scranton, Pennsylvania. <laughs> Carrie, tell us about Wisdom from the Bat Cave. Well, the book presents life philosophy that emerges from the Batman mythology. Batman is consistently considered to be one of the most popular characters in pop culture. And what I did in the book is I tried to identify what those essential defining themes are. How did you come to write this book? I was the rabbi at Duke University for four years, and I was giving classes, and the kids were just really, really not all that interested in what all these Aramaic and Hebrew texts had to say. So I hit on the strategy the thing that I know most of all, best of all, my lifelong obsession is with Batman. I have a uh, mountain of all kinds of Batman saskala, everything you can imagine from a lifetime of collecting. And I also have all the comic books, not all of them, but many, you know, thousands. So I would find some issue and I would copy off a page that described some kind of an ethical dilemma. Batman would be uh, in search of the bad guys and he'd find somebody and he would dangle this fellow off the roof and he would say, you tell me where they are or I'm going to drop you. And the comic book would describe someone saying to him, is that legal what you're doing? And he would say, well, I'm not interested in the law, I'm interested in justice. So I would begin a conversation with the kids. Why is it that the law and justice are not the same? And I would talk to them, where do these overlap? When are they in conflict with each other? And the kids would be animated. I mean, when they first see the comic book page, they would smirk or they would roll their eyes. They would think, oh, this man is such a neb. Why is he doing this? But they would get into it and they would laugh. You know, everyone would laugh. Nothing Aramaic. There's nothing abstruse or esoteric. Ten, fifteen minutes into the conversation, I would hand out a page taken from some primary Jewish source. And I would identify those different ideas that they had come up with in the text. And the kids loved it. And they would get really, really into the discussions. After we were there for four years, I took my notes and I transcribed them. And from those notes came wisdom from the Batcave. What makes Batman unique as a superhero? Well, unique among superheroes, he possesses no superhuman powers. His story begins with a very tragic, defining moment. His parents are killed in front of him. And then the story is, what does he do with the rest of his life? He does a million push-ups, and he studies everything there is that one could possibly study in order to do his self-appointed task. He's going to try to ensure that other people not have to suffer the same kind of misfortune and tragedy that he has. That's a story as a mashal, is a story that we can all relate to, and it's very, very relevant to us. Certainly in my own case, that's why the Batman character is relevant to me. My mother's a Holocaust survivor, and I grew up in a house filled with Holocaust survivors, and they would be telling their stories, and it was amazing to me what these people endured and what they did with the rest of their lives. My mother's life has been a response, a very life-affirming response to what it was that she experienced, and I identified those kind of same themes within the Batman character. 
So it's his essential, fundamental humanness and lack of any kind of uh, superpowers that make him the character of all of the comic book characters that we can most identify with. The book is written for a general audience, but it includes strong Jewish themes. Can you talk about that? I wanted to produce a book that would be universal in character. Every person who read the book, depending on where they were coming from, said to me, oh, I related to the book on this level that I'm comfortable with, and there were intriguing other kinds of themes that I'm not really uh, familiar with. So if Jewish people read it, they said the Batman references were very new and intriguing to me. If comic book readers looked at the book, they said the comic book stuff I totally had down, but the religious references were very intriguing to me. What do you most want readers to learn from Batman and to learn from your book? My hope is that people will recognize that in the course of their own lives, we, we tend to dismiss what we do as being insignificant, and uh, it's just not true. You know, when you read the comic books, obviously it's very, very dramatic, exciting kinds of things. He's saving the world, he's battling supervillains, but the qualities that he possesses that allow him to do those kinds of things those are the same qualities that we all possess to some degree. We can work on them, we can build them up, we can strengthen them within ourselves, and we can be heroic in our own lives. The book is subtitled, How to Live a Super Heroic Life, and I was careful to put a comma between the words super and heroic. I'm not advocating anybody to become a superhero and go battle super villains, but everybody can live a super and heroic in life. We can make a difference in the lives of the people that we encounter, our family members, the people around us. There are endless opportunities to be heroic in a very real, meaningful way and make a difference in the lives of all the people around us. So that's what I hope. I hope people will read it and will say, I could do those things and I could become the superhero, the, the hero of my own life. How has Batman influenced your own life? <laughs> I have been obsessed with Batman since I was four. Um, when I was a kid, the Batman TV show was on with Adam West. I was a little stupid kid. It never even occurred to me that it was a campy, corny version. It, the humorous aspect of it went right over my head. So I watched the show, and I saw all of the amazing things that he knew, and I dedicated myself from that time on. One of the episodes guest starred Liberace and Batman displays this encyclopedic knowledge of various musical composers. I was a little kid, and I thought, listen, if I'm going to fight crime, I'm going to have to know that. So I used to go to the library every week, and I took out everything they had on, on classical music. I, anything I saw on the show, I said to myself, I'm going to acquire that skill. And I worked on it for years, and by the time I was sophisticated enough to realize that I had been had, and that they were making fun of the whole Batman character, it was too late. I was on my way. I had been working out, I had been reading, I had been studying all my career choices and the things that I've done, trying to see what characteristics I could share in common with him in being heroic and trying to make a difference in the world. So I went into the sciences, I went into the rabbinus, I decided to become a rabbi because I felt that was the most meaningful way that I could express these kinds of Batman values. So the, uh, the Torah education has deepened and refined what I know to be true, and, uh, but I learned all those things first. They came to me from Batman. It's, uh, it's kind of funny, and I'm sometimes a little bit uh, embarrassed to admit this, but the, the trajectory of my life, my career, my relationships with people, all of those things have been influenced to an incredible degree from my obsession with Batman. It's weird, but, you know, it's <laughs> <laughs> But cool. Weird in a good way. Exactly. Um, <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Rabbi Carrie Friedman, thanks so much for speaking with us. It's been a pleasure. Thank you very much. Father and son team Harold and Yoshi Fruchter have created a CD that explores the subconscious of our biblical ancestors. It's called Beyond the Book, and you can get it through yoshifruchter.com. Let's hear Yoshi's comments now about Beyond the Book. I've been patient these years and I've trusted my one love As we traveled the land to find what we've been dreaming Beyond the Book is a project that I created with my father, Harold And my, my father is actually a musician as well You know, we sort of had had this idea brewing for a while 
I thought a great way to put our heads together would be to create a project where we could really use music to get inside some of the biblical passages that I had grown up studying. We thought a really great way to get inside the heads of some of these characters would be to imagine that they were writing and creating music and poetry about their situations. And it's funny to me how you'll be in my life Bring to my loneliness tears of delight And it's funny how sometimes things happen just right And I'm laughing cause I can't believe I realized, trying to create this project, how flat these stories had been to me. I, not that they didn't have meaning, but I, I didn't really grasp the complexity of the stories of the characters in the, in the Torah and the Bible. And by trying to think about their various situations in their heads, it really brought their stories to life. So, for example, one of the songs that I really like is Adam's Song the first man right after he's expelled from the Garden of Eden reflecting on what he had lost out on you know I wouldn't have thought of that had I not really tried to put myself in his shoes and tried to understand what he would have been going through and I think we can learn different kinds of life lessons by doing that before, still know what's been here before Wake up, Jacob, I'm here to tell you I'll be by your side. You don't have to hide. I think some of the traditional lessons that we learn from these characters, we get them because of the way that they're presented to us. Jacob's story. There's a song written from the perspective of Leah, who is Jacob's wife and he was tricked into marrying Leah by Lavan. You know, when I learned this story, we see Jacob's righteousness and we see how he was ready to put himself on the lines in order that he could marry Rachel. And what sort of gets clouded over, I thought, was Leah's response to this situation. Here's a woman who, according to Midrash, was slated to marry Asaph, who was Jacob's not-so-nice older brother. And she was sort of thrown into this situation where she was given the chance to marry Jacob, who would have been like a much better fit, but she has to deal with the fact that she is not the woman that he wants to marry, and yet here they are getting into a marriage. So the song sort of explores her thoughts and her attempts to get Jacob to just love her, at least on like a surface level. And I think that's sort of a different lesson, a lesson of like love and relationships, you know, that doesn't necessarily always get highlighted in that story. Jacob, Jacob, together now our future's open wide. You don't have to There's nothing left here cause you washed it away I think people need something that's a little more tangible, that's a little more real and human. It's just a way that a modern person can relate in a little bit more of a real way to biblical texts that when you really look at them as what they are, seem very ancient and sometimes outdated. For any educators who are listening to the show, I'm launching an educational program behind this CD. What I'd like to do is to create a program where people could sort of uh, do their own writing and do their own looking into these characters. Life lives happily, but why this way? Rebecca's Journey Home is Bryn Olenberg Sugarman's fictionalized chronicle of her own family's experience with adopting their daughter. 
the picture book won a Sidney Taylor Silver Medal, and Bryn traveled all the way from Israel to accept her award at the Association of Jewish Libraries Conference in Scottsdale, Arizona, this summer. After Bryn's excellent presentation on her book, I spirited her away for a quick interview before dinner. Bryn, tell us about Rebecca's journey home. Rebecca's journey home is about a family who decides to adopt a child from Vietnam, and it's about her journey home to her new family, home being her destiny to become a Jewish child living in America as opposed to an orphaned baby in Vietnam. And the message of the book is that we are all more than one thing at the same time. Rebecca is American and Vietnamese and Jewish. The idea for Rebecca's Journey Home came when my daughter was five because I realized that although there were many books on adoption, there was not a book which came specifically from a Jewish angle. And I wanted there to be one, and I am a writer, and I figured here's a perfect opportunity. How does the book parallel your own experience with adopting your daughter? I adopted my daughter from Vietnam, and her name is Rachel as opposed to Rebecca, but the book is a fictionalized version of my family's own experience. My first exposure to adoption was actually with family in 1968. My cousin Lisa was adopted from Korea, and she was the inspiration for me to someday also adopt. And 30 years went by, and I hadn't changed my mind. My husband, thank God, was like-minded, and we went ahead, and um, my lifelong dream came true of adopting a child. Now, you already had biological children yes. when you decided to adopt Rachel. Yes. What did your sons think about this? They were completely supportive, and to them, just as it was role model to me and my family that adoption is a natural thing, they've obviously had the same thing role modeled within their own family. So for them, it's just a part of their lives, and they, are, they were waiting to meet their little sister. It's almost like with pregnancy, where the baby is in utero, the older children haven't met their sibling yet. Well, Vietnam was kind of the uterus, and, uh, and they were waiting for their sister to come to them and become a part of the family. I've heard you speak about a domino effect related to your adoption of Rachel. Can you talk about that? Well, there was a domino effect from the very start in that if I hadn't been exposed to adoption when I was only seven years old, it may not have ever occurred to me to adopt a child. In spite of the fact that biological reproduction wasn't an issue for me, I longed to adopt in addition to that. Since Rachel's adoption, another couple who had won and couldn't have any more kids, they were reticent about the adoption option because they hadn't had a role model. And, and when they met Rachel, they were so inspired that they wound up going to Siberia and adopting two children, and a friend of theirs has since adopted after being exposed to their two adopted children. So there are all these children that have found homes due to role modeling that came before them, and I find that to be very exciting, how we can touch one another. Do you intend this book for Jewish families who have adopted Asian children who practice Judaism at a specific level? Who is it aimed at? The book is aimed at a broader audience. I think that it can take its place among all of the multicultural options that are out there. I think that any child can benefit by reading the book because it's important for all children to know about adoption, regardless of whether they personally are adopted or not. The fact that it's coming from a Jewish cultural angle is also fine in terms of children who are, who are not Jewish, as well as children who are Jewish. I think that it enriches their lives. I believe that the book lends itself to activities for children. For Jewish children, many of them have both a Hebrew name and an English name. So even if a child isn't adopted, that child has many aspects to his or her character. One can start out using something very concrete, such as a Hebrew name and an English name, already expresses two different aspects of the child's identity. Talking about with any child the different aspects that make up you, that your identity 
is diverse. And especially in our society today, where there's often uh, intermarriage or a variety of different ethnicities combined. And I also think that art projects that can be done with this would be a photo album, maybe a collage or using paints to express the different aspects of one's personality, that I can be many things at once, just like baby Rebecca is in the book. What does Rachel think about this book? Rachel is extremely excited by the book. Uh, she's proud of it. I think that it has really helped with her self-esteem because she has a positive feeling about her position as an adopted child, and the book, the book has certainly helped with that. And I'm hoping that it does the same for other children who are adopted who are exposed to the book. She loves to come to readings with me, and she likes to sign her name on the book as well. And she's very excited right now about the uh, Sidney Taylor Award that I won. It's all very positive. Bryn Olenberg Sugarman, thanks so much for speaking with us. You're welcome. It's been my pleasure. <laughs> Don't forget to inscribe yourself into the Book of Life's Book of Life at jewishbooks.blogspot.com. And remember, you can now order your own Book of Life t-shirt with original art by Caldecott medalist, author, illustrator, Sims Tayback at printfection.com slash bookoflife. As always, we would love to hear from you. Email bookoflifepodcast at gmail.com. Post a comment on our website, or if your computer has a microphone, leave a two-minute voice message by clicking on the voicemail link on our website at jewishbooks.blogspot.com. You can also add your pin to our listener map to show us where you're listening from. The Book of Life is supported in part by the Association of Jewish Libraries, tending the tree of knowledge and promoting Jewish reading by supporting Judaic libraries and librarians. Visit them on the web at jewishlibraries.org. Our background music is provided by the Freilach Makers Klezmer String Band from Sacramento, California, whose CDs feature upbeat music from Ashkenazic and Sephardic traditions with Brazilian, Gypsy, and Celtic influences. Borrow their CDs at the Feldman Library or buy your own copies at freilachmakers.com. To download episodes of the Book of Life podcast, visit us on the web at jewishbooks.blogspot.com. That's jewishbooks, one word, dot B-L-O-G-S-P-O-T dot com. Links to the books and CDs mentioned on the show are available on this website. You can also hear the latest episode by phone. Just call 916-313-3820. Thanks for listening, and happy reading. Happy reading.